you, Dr. Barbara Brand, who is our partner. Barbara attends our Gate Advisory Committee meetings, our board meetings, and uh, has a very, very good handle on our district, has served as our wonderful professional consultant and uh, for specialist. For free. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we can't thank her enough, that is true. And for those of you who may have uh, friends who are not able to be here tonight, we have our GBIT team here tonight doing our uh, videotaping from Granite Bay High School. Thank you very much. And this will be videotaped and formatted so that it will be up on our game website, both the parent and the teacher presentations. So with that, we'd like to welcome Dr. Branch. Take it away. Good evening. Thank you so much for coming. You don't need to clap. I'm so happy to be here and happy to be what I call your champion. Um, I've been in gifted education for over 35 years and education for over 40 something. I won't even tell you how many. Um, let's just say I'm eligible for Medicare now. <laughs> and that should tell you. But um, I, have, I was a gate teacher and a principal of a school with a gate program and the director of the program in Sacramento City Unified and I retired and, did, and was doing consulting, helping school districts um, create their, their gate plans when we had them from the state. And that sort of dwindled, and then I started volunteering at the um, California Association for the Gifted Office, which is just over here in Orangevale. And then the executive director decided to retire, so guess what I am now? <laughs> I have unretired. But I continue to do this because it's, I'm so passionate about gifted kids. It's something that I've, you know, ever since I started teaching gifted and learned about gifted kids, it, it's just something that's, that's in my soul. So um, I continue to do this kind of work and support somebody like Linda who's making the program better in their district. Sadly, so many districts in California are doing absolutely nothing now in terms of gifted. Uh, parents call me every day and say, you know, my kid's not getting anything, what do I do? And it's just a travesty. So you have um, a wonderful support here, which is great, and I'm, I'm pleased to be with you. Um, I'm sure that you're here this evening because you do not have any children that have any intensities. <laughs> That's probably why you came, just to, to hear something that you don't have any interest in. I know that's why you're here because um, these probably do come up and they are concerns of yours and it is something that goes with gifted kids so let's talk about it. Um, first of all the agenda will be that I'm going to share just very quickly with you kind of how we came to understand the intensities of gifted children through uh, the work of, of a Polish psychologist by the name of Dabrowski um, and then we'll talk about intensity in gifted children, and then I'll um, share some suggestions about parenting strategies that you can use to, um, to help you support your gifted children, which is, I'm sure is the, the reason that you're here. Earlier today, I shared the first two things with the gate teachers and then shared some teaching strategies with them so that um, you can maybe work together um, if there are issues that need to be uh, need to be dealt with in terms of school. So let's get on with it. Um, Dabrowski, I will not even attempt to say his first name, was a Polish psychologist who only recently died in 1980, so it's, he's not you know an old time guy. He was around at the uh, beginning of the century, uh, 19, or 20th century. And he developed, um, after observing lots and lots of, of gifted, both adults and children, he, he came up with, with a theory that has two concepts. One he called developmental potential. And that is that we are born with some kind of potential to develop as far as we can go. And everybody has a different level of it. Um, it's your initial opportunity for growth. Now, if you are a child with this particular, um, you know, potential that that resides within you when you're born, and you are in um, a, a situation of poverty or lack of language development or abuse or other kinds of um, environmental <coughs> constraints, then the potential may not grow. But if you live in Granite Bay, where you have mostly two-parent families and parents are uh, 
aware and environmentally enrich their children, then the potential grows. So Dabrowski's theory was it's there, it, but it has to be potentiated. And it depends on how it's nurtured and how it's, how it's developed. It doesn't just magically grow if there's no, um, if there's no actualization of it. Um, and then his other theory is called multi-levelness. There will be a, a vocabulary quiz at the end, by the way, because <laughs> these aren't the only big words we have. Um, my spell check did not understand overexcitability, so <laughs> it's obviously a new word for us, or else I spelled it wrong. Um, Multi-levelness means that we have various levels of inner growth, and it, it kind of connects with Maslow's hierarchy of needs and, and um, growth, if you've heard about that. And it might be higher in a younger person who has been self-integrated. In other words, a child who has had the opportunity to think about who they are and, and um, participate in their own growth opportunities, and I'm not talking physical growth, but you know, mental growth, um, might have a higher level of multi-levelness than, um, than another child. But the work is is about personal growth and so this is the area where he talks about um, metacognition and how we can um, we can grow as an individual there's the potential there and then there's the process of working on your own personal growth and it's not something anybody else can do for you but you can you can as parents provide tools and support for a child being able to do that and teachers can provide you know, opportunities as well. So that's Dabrowski, and I'm, without getting, you know, way into his stuff, he was kind of the precursor of what we now understand to be intensities in gifted children. He had what he called the excitabilities, and there are five areas. They can be psychomotor, sensual, intellectual, imaginational, or emotional. And psychomotor is, um, the surplus of energy, somebody that can't sit still, somebody that talks quickly, um, has need for action all the time. This is very too far often, that's not a very good sentence, but this is far too often misdiagnosed as ADHD. And interestingly enough, we very few psychologists and um, pediatricians and doctors really understand giftedness. So they will overdiagnose ADHD as opposed to um, realizing that the child might be gifted. Even when an IQ test is given by a psychologist who isn't trained in giftedness, they can give the test, they know how to interpret it, they know what the numbers mean, but they don't necessarily know how to apply that to giftedness. So these kinds of people are far and few between and we get this tremendous misdiagnosis of ADHD where gifted kids who should be given the opportunity to move and, and take actions and you know, do that kind of thing, which is what they need, they get put on meds or um, you know, some other thing that, that um, treats ADHD. So that's sad. Um, there's also the second excite overexcitability is the sensual. These are the kids who don't like labels in their um, clothes, clothes are too tight, they'd rather run around naked probably, um, just because it feels better, it's freer, and it, you know, it's more sensual to their, to their feelings. This is also people who, who find tastes more interesting than others, and I sort of was sharing with the teachers earlier, I sort of have discovered this about myself lately, um, I love to go, you know, to a, to a nice restaurant and have the wine and the ambiance and the people that you're with and everything, but I think that what I really like the most about it is enjoying the tastes of a good meal. I am a lousy cook, so I don't get good <laughs> tastes at home, and it's kind of hard to cook for yourself. So I, and I, it took me a long time to figure out why I enjoy doing that, and it's not, it's not the other things, it's, the taste of the food, and then savoring that taste later and remembering how delicious it was. I just recently got back from a Mississippi riverboat cruise, and the food was 
um, all New Orleans style, um, wonderfully prepared stuff, and it just accentuated my taste for a whole week. And I didn't overeat either. It was just that I enjoyed the tastes. Um, these are also kids who find beauty in aesthetic beauty and in, in music and those kinds of things much more than than other people do. Um, then there's the intellectual overexcitability, and by the way, any gifted child can have one or more of these. Most have maybe two or three of them, but probably not all of them, or they would, you know, they just explode. But um, probably have two or three of them, and you're pro there are probably people sitting out here right now thinking, hmm, that's me. So uh, fruit doesn't fall far from the tree. The intellectual overexcitability is the child who is extremely curious, has a capacity for sustained intellectual effort, really wants to dive into something deeply, um, and searches for truth and understanding. These are the kids who want to know what, what is real and what is true and, and what is morally right and um, how do we really get to the center of whatever it is they're thinking about. And they have a, they're very capable of reflective thought. Um, they can take an idea and really reflect on it and think about it. Um, not, to, not just intellectually, but also emotionally and physically and everything else. Um, the imaginational overexcitability is Steven Spielberg, Walt Disney, those people who have very creative thinking, capacity for image and fantasy. These are often kids who have imaginary friends. Do any of you have a child with an imaginary friend? They may not, they may not even make you aware of that, of that but sometimes it's, it's um, the reason is because there's nobody else to talk to who is interested in what they're interested in. So if you create an imaginary person, then you're not nuts talking to yourself. So this, you know, this often develops from, from an interest in wanting to, to share things with others who otherwise there wouldn't be any real people to do it with. And these are kids who have the need for novelty and variety. And then there's the emotional, and that's what we're gonna talk about the most tonight. These are kids with extremes of, e of emotion, and it doesn't always have to be to the extreme that they're, that they're um, bipolar or, you know, that kind of thing. But one minute they're extremely happy, and then the next minute, you know, everything is a disaster. And they sort of go a little too far on, on both ends. But they're also very empathetic and care a great deal about others. Um, I was a sixth grade gate teacher for a long time and, and one year I had a, um, a boy in my class who was extremely empathetic and if anybody had a problem, he would gather the entire class at recess, solve the problem, make the person feel better and come back in and then say, you know, it's all taken care of. It was amazing, amazing kid especially a boy at that, at that age. Girls are often sort of, you know, in that realm, but, but to be a boy like that. Um, I Facebook with him now, it's fun. Aww. Facebook with a lot of these kids, it's really cool. They're not kids anymore. They're, they're as old or older than you guys are. Um, these are also kids who are often shy and timid. They, they, because of the extremes of emotion, they know that that sometimes, you know, it looks kind of weird to other people, so they will tend to withdraw and sort of keep those emotions in because they don't want, you know, they don't want the ridicule or the, or the harassing or the bullying or the being laughed at or whatever of being too dramatic or too emotional, so they tend to, to withdraw. But they also have a capacity for strong attachments. These are the kids that have maybe only one or two really good friends, but those, that those attachments are extremely strong. They don't have lots of different friends, but those ones that they do, their attachment is tremendous. So in learning about the overexcitabilities, this excitabilities, this leads us to understanding intensities in gifted children. There is the intensity of thought, and that is the mind worrying all the time and always thinking about things being very intense about that kind of goes along with 
um, the overexcitability of, of intellect. Um, intensity of purpose, this is, this is the child who um, will persist in doing something regardless of the consequences until it's done or until they're happy with it. So, you know, if, if the teacher's calling everybody up to the reading circle and they're over in the corner still reading a book that they picked up and they're not coming to the reading circle until that book's done, that's, um, that's this kid with intensity of purpose. Intensity of emotion is internalizing anything that anybody says about them, being just too sensitive almost. Although that's who they are, they can't help it. Intensity of spirit is that child who's always looking for someone less fortunate to help, who um, you know, wants to work at the dog shelter, who wants to save all the poor kids that don't have any food, who wants to you know, solve world problems. These are kids that, that are really concerned about, uh, about that. And also the kids who asked, like, who is God? What is, you know, what is that all about? And, and most kids, you know, a lot of kids go to church and have, and have uh, religious or spiritual backgrounds in their families, but they don't really question. They just know that we believe in Jesus or we believe in God or we believe in Muhammad or whatever, but they don't say, who is God? Who is this? Is that an entity? Is it a person? Where do they how, What do they look like? You know, they're really interested in that in a deeper level than most kids. And then there's the kid who is the philosopher. Why does this happen? Um, why can't we have definitive answers to everything? Why can't we solve all the world's problems? That kind of philosopher kid. So emotional intensity is the one we want to focus on, though. And emotional intensity in the gifted is not a matter of feeling more than other people. It's not being more emotional. It's being feeling in a different way. And in the brain of, of gifted people, there's a lot of metabolic activity going on as synapses connect with each other. That's how brain cells connect to each other metabolically. And there's much more activity going on in the brain of, of a gifted person. So that leads to this heightened sensitivity uh, for everything. Things are more vivid, more absorbing, more penetrating, more encompassing. It's like being what, what um, someone called quiveringly alive. Just being, you know, sensing all the time, being aware of things all the time that most people are not. But the intensities do lead to some problems for gifted kids. Being too emotionally intense, we kind of talked about that. Having unrealistic expectations of themselves, being too perfectionistic. And we could talk a whole other hour on perfectionism, but that, that is a concern um, sometimes, but can also lead to depression. So it's something to be aware of. These kids might be excessively competitive they might have a low frustration tolerance. They get frustrated very quickly and are not tolerant of either of others or even of themselves if something is frustrating. One of the important things for these kids is to learn early to take risks, fall down, pick yourself back up, learn from it, and move on. It's so easy to be, to not be challenged for so many years as a gifted person, um, academically or even emotionally sometimes. And the older you get, the harder it is to learn to take risks. You know, if you breeze through high school and, and get to college and go, whoa, everybody else is smart too, then, you know, there's a lot of time lost where you should have been learning to take some risks and and, and learn from them. So they sometimes have to be taught that tolerance. Um, they're easily hurt, we kind of talked about that. They feel powerless to solve world problems, we talked about that. Um, they're impatient and they see, they seize, 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 seize or nose. They see or know, <laughs> little boo-boo there. 
they see or know too much. They, you know, when they look at things, they can see more than the rest of us can. So they can see the beauty in something, or you can see the intricacy in something, and so it, um, you know, it, it it almost is overwhelming to them, and they're impatient that others don't see that, or that something isn't getting solved quickly, or that, you know, something isn't being done quickly. So they sometimes become disruptive for the class clown. It's easier to be funny in the class clown than it is to express your emotions and be ridiculed for that. It's easier to be accepted as the class clown because everybody likes a class clown. Imagine being Robin Williams' teacher <laughs> or mother or dears. Um, so, you know, they end up being the class clown to sort of compensate for not wanting the emotionality or the sensitivity or the awareness to show. Um, they use humor to seek attention because that, that's easier than, you know, than dealing with uh, the emotionality. Uh, they're also excessively questioning all the time. Why, 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 why? Why does this work? Why does this happen? You know, we usually think of, what is it, the twos or threes where they ask, I don't have any children, so I don't know the little kids. Two or three where they're saying, why, but why, but why? But these kids continue to do it because they want to know more. Uh, they sometimes go too far and seem disruptive. And they are unable to accept help often because they think they should be able to do everything already. And that all comes from all that intensity. I think I shared this information for those of you who were last time. Um, this is just a little bit more about it. There was a study done called Brains on Fire, and um, it was doing functional MRIs while people were being tested. And the, the gifted people's brains were much more lit up on the functional MRI, showing that they had much more metabolic activity and much more cross-brain activity. You know, we don't talk a lot about the left and right brain thing anymore, somebody being left-brained or right-brained, but there is still good information about that. And what we know with gifted people is that they cross over on their brain much more often to, um, to do things, to solve problems or to think about things. Um, if you, you know, use, in, mo in most average people there's like, you see a language center operating but in the brain of the gifted, it's the language center plus this cross brain. Now gentlemen, I hate to tell you this, but women's brains, physically, we can't help it, we cross brain much better than you do. You work much more on one side or the other, and I'm sorry, but that's just physical. We can't help it, but we do do it better. That's probably why you can't talk while you're clicking. Because you have to focus on one side or the other, talking's on one side, clicking's on the other. So just in case you were curious about that, I thought I'd share that. But it is real brain research. What can I tell you? Um, so what we, what we learned from this study and, what, and these two psychologists um, who have been doing this kind of work for a long time, um, they found that, we're, that gifted kids are not m one mode thinkers, that they're multi-modal thinkers. So they do multi-modality, multi-thinking multi at the same time. Um, they also have, though, enhanced distractibility because of that. But that can lead to creativity. So the kid that's daydreaming is probably thinking up something really creative and amazingly can come right back to task. And this drives teachers nuts because they'll say, you're not paying any attention to me. What did I just say? The kid says, well, you said yada, 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 yada. They're exactly right, and they've been daydreaming the whole time. So it's something that as teachers we have to learn, maybe they are paying attention. I used to do that all the time in meetings when I hated paying attention and got in trouble a lot for it. But that's because my boss didn't understand. <laughs> um, they also need time for rumination and reflection. And we, we talked about that as teachers today, that we, we really don't um, spend a whole lot of time helping kids have reflection time and thinking about things, thinking about thinking even. 
um, we talked, you want to share what the uh, math people mm -hmm. talked about? Yeah. Um, I was um, talking at the teachers meeting um, yesterday we had our math curriculum committee meeting and many of you raise your hand if your students are in a classroom where the teachers have been piloting some new materials okay so some and the, some of the students have been frustrated with that some of the parents have been frustrated because it's sort of jumping in in the middle so we talked a little bit with the um, teachers that came together yesterday afternoon we had TK to 2 third fourth and fifth and sixth eighth all in groups the TK to 2 group had quite a discussion about how some of the materials counted for on the teachers to offer a lot of wait time opportunities for kids to consider and not necessarily respond right away because they needed to look at a lot of things maybe manipulate some other kinds of uh, materials and formulate different ways that a problem could be solved before making a presentation. And the teachers were saying that that's hard for them because in primary grades, I'm a kindergarten teacher and I can relate to that, things happen very quickly. You move to a lot of different activities. But with Common Core and the concept of expanding what we know and calling upon prior knowledge, putting it all together, and then synthesizing another result that might be different from your neighboring group over here, it takes time. And so there's a lot of training that we need to do. And with our, our gifted students, it, especially when we create our cluster classes, clusters within the classes, we're going to need to really focus on how does that feel to a teacher. So one of the, one of the primary things that we'll be doing, we'll be putting up a public display of the materials that are going to be recommended to the board and that that will be up on Friday and I'll give you a sneak peek at that. Um, TK to fifth grade we are going to publicly display the Envision program so if you have a kindergarten through second grade student you've already experienced that program. It's going to be a little different. Sixth through eighth grade we are going to recommend the Carnegie program which is in sync with the high school program and if you uh, if you have a fifth through eighth grade students, you've, you've received an invitation to the Math Pathways program, which talks about our integration all the way to the 12th grade. But one of the, that's on May 12th, by the way, at Oakmont High School. Everybody's welcome to attend. We have plenty of room. But in particular, we wanted our current fifth grade through eighth grade parents to be there to hear about their progression into high school, which will also be using the Carnegie program. So to the end of the teachers feeling uncomfortable or a little bit worried about that wait time, what were we going to do about that? When we begin the year next year, that'll be the focus of our training. How does that feel? What does it look like? How do we make it work? Because it's important for the students. And so we need to rethink, re reteach, retune uh, the way that we're doing things because the kids really need us to do that. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Perfect. Good segue. Okay, so um, so how let's let me share with you now some thoughts about your role in this and how how you can nurture emotional intensity so that it's not a bad thing. Um, one of the important things that, that I think is critical for gifted children is that we far too often we reward them verbally or you know otherwise for their products for their successes, for 100%, for an A. And what we really need to look at is how much effort was put in. Because if you can, the night before it's due, if you can create a product that's as good as somebody who worked two weeks hard on it and learned some new things and all you did was put down some stuff you already knew and create a product that looks just as good, should you really be rewarded for that product? You didn't put any effort in and you didn't learn anything new. The kid that worked for two weeks on it and learned some new things to put into it may come out with the same product, but they should be rewarded for their effort as opposed to the you know, kid who does it the night before. Now, of course, if they come to you and say, we have to go to Walmart right now and buy a board and I need to, you know, that, that comes up often, I know, with these kids. But we need to think about ways to support effort as opposed to product. 
So when something comes home, you know, ask the question. What did you learn new from this? How much effort did you put into getting, if you already knew all the spelling words, so you got 100%, but you already knew them, so of course you're gonna get 100%. But what effort did you put in? What new thing did you learn? And, and try to focus on that as a, and let them begin to think about that and talk about it. It might, um, you know, it's so easy with our bright kids to, to reward them for their successes and their products all the time. We need, to, um, we need to think more about effort. And that will, in turn, reduce some of this perfectionism. Because if they know that it's important to you that effort be put in and that something new be learned, and maybe it's not quite as good as the next person, but something was learned and effort was put in, that's really more rewarding in the long run. Um, we need to give gifted kids responsibilities that are age appropriate because they are still age, you know, they're still age kids, but and also emotionally appropriate, but they do need responsibilities, and, and I hope that as um, parents with um, plenty of means that you're not just taking care of everything for them, that they're cleaning their own rooms and you know that they have responsibilities that are age appropriate because that will help um, develop some, some of the um, awareness of their sensitivities. Um, understand that what your gifted child is doing, if they're throwing throwing themselves down on the floor and, you know, going into a whole dramatic thing, that that sensitivity is there. That's who they are, but maybe that's not an appropriate way to show it. So you need to help them learn alternatives to the drama that goes on, or you need to learn how to walk away from it. And, and you know, I always used to say to the kids when this kind of thing would go on, which was often in a glass full of gifted kids, then they, they, I just watch and they'd be finished and then I say, well, do you feel better now? <laughs> yes, okay, then let's go on. You know, no reaction to it, just waiting for it to be done. And it doesn't get the attention that they thought it would, so, it, you know, it, the emotionality and the intensity is still there, but perhaps the behavior isn't appropriate and they do need to learn that. We had a little conversation about that with the teachers. Um, one of the things that you can help with your intense children is to teach them coping skills. Just like we learn coping skills for things, you know, that bother us. Um, maybe even like, um, what could you do instead? If, instead of throwing yourself on the floor, maybe you can go in and, um, you know, journal this or blog it. Gifted kids love to blog. And you really should provide your kids with an opportunity, if they like that kind of thing, to create their own blog and share that with, with other kids. And there's plenty of free sites now online where you can, where they're safe, they're monitored, and yet they can you know, share and express their feelings. Um, of course, create a nurturing home environment in which the child can feel safe and yet creative. And that means providing opportunities for creativity, but also for, for safety, and not just physical safety, but safety of thought, and safety of emotion, and safety of sharing how they're feeling about things. As they get older, and as they get into middle school, that's really hard, because they don't want to share anything with you anymore. So if you start early, then that, hopefully that door is there. Uh, I think a really good place to share, share things sometimes when they're not too personal is the dinner table. You know, try to create an opportunity for everybody to share something, or, and, and not just, you know, if you say, how was your day? Boring. <laughs> and that's what you get. But what's something new you learned today? Then that opens the conversation up. Um, I read a thing that Dr. Laura had written uh, one time in response to somebody, and she's in, in talking about the dinner table, and she said, um, Make someone each night responsible for what the topic's going to be. So if it's your turn, then you come up with what the question is going to be. And it can't just be, how was your day? It has to be something that everybody can 
share something about. So what did you what did you play on the playground today, or what did, you know? Make the questions be things that every and, and make sure that dad and mom are both responding too. So you know, a mom can say, "This is what I did at work today that was a bit like that." So that that everybody's sharing. I thought that was a good idea. Um, you have to accept these emotions because they are who they are. But as we said before. The, the inappropriate behaviors don't have to go with them. So you need to find ways to help them figure out another way to share that emotion, whatever it is. But don't try to minimize the emotions. Accept the emotions, understand that they're there, provide an opportunity and an avenue for discussing them or getting them out or you know, whatever it is that maybe you need to go outside and throw the ball back and forth and talk about it. Maybe, you need, maybe there needs to be something else that's and take a walk and talk about it so that there's something else going on while the discussion's happening so it's not just you two sitting at the table looking and staring at each other because that, you know, that's not comfortable for either one of you. Um, teach gifted children that their feelings are normal and, the, and again, as I say, you can't have inappropriate behavior because that that disrupts other people. That's not fair to other people. Other people don't like to be disrupted. Other people don't want to see you throw yourself on the floor or you know whatever it is. Um, one of the really critical things for gifted kids, and I learned this as a kid as a teacher of gifted kids, is that they actually require more structure and more discipline than the average kid because that brain, you know, is all over the place. And if there's not something, excuse me, to help them structure their thinking and their behavior and what they do, then, you know, they could just go amok. So you need to provide good structure. I said the same thing to the teachers, good discipline. My kids always said, you're strict, but you're fair. And that was important to me because they knew that I was going to be consistent. I wasn't going to say this one day and this another day. So, you know, it's kind of tough. But, but that, that boundary that was set was for their safety, both, the, both emotionally and physically. So that's really important in the home, too. And so mom and dad have to be on the same wavelength, um, you know, and that sometimes is hard for kids um, if they're not. They need to discuss their feelings openly, so you need to provide opportunities. Sometimes, um, you know, just have a, um, it's your turn, I'm going to, you and I are going to go to McDonald's together, mom and so-and-so are going to stay at home or whatever, it's just our time. So there's an opportunity for talking or, or for sharing, that's, that's their special time. Um, you can also help them use expressive outlets such as art, music, poetry, journaling, and as I said, gifted kids love blogging. Just love it, and it's a great way for them now to be able to, um, you know, to share their their feeling, even if they're just sharing it with themselves and keeping their own blog just so they have it. It's it's a way of, of uh, getting things out, and there's not the tedium of handwriting, which is sometimes a challenge. It is for me. <laughs> um, a psychologist who has done a lot of writing, and she's a very interesting lady because she writes about emotionality and gifted, but she also writes murder mysteries. So she's a kind of an interesting person. Her name is Christine Fonseca, and she talks about being an emotional coach. Coaching moves away from telling a child what to do and focuses on giving him or her the tools necessary to independently figure things out. So the more that you can help your child learn the tools of figuring things out for themselves as opposed to you just solving it or saying this is, this is how it should be done, um, the, the better off they're going to be. With the teachers, I talked about presenting what are called moral dilemmas, and you could certainly do that too. Um, in coming up with the rules of a class, for example, Instead of saying, we're going to have this, this, and this as the rules, as the teacher, you present what are called moral dilemmas. What if this happened on the playground? Which, you know, the, 
there's one side and here's the other side. So we have what, what we call a moral dilemma. So what's the solution to this? And it usually comes up that there should be a rule about like two people want the ball and there's only one ball. So what's the, the moral dilemma is that who's gonna get the ball? And it's not a world crisis, but it, you know, it certainly might be to them. So then they come up with some kind of a rule about sharing or taking turns or you know something like that that you could have come up with, but it wouldn't have, they wouldn't have owned it. Now when you present a moral dilemma to think about, they own it, they came up with it. Then you could, do, you could certainly do the same thing at home. Um, there's all kinds of information online, I'm sure, about moral dilemmas, so just look it up and you'll find some ideas. Um, teach specific strategies so that kids can learn to self-monitor and adjust their own behavior. So they're going to, they, they need to learn how to self-adjust and, and, and monitor their own behavior as opposed to you saying, no, don't do this, no, don't do that. How can they do that? Um, focus, the focus should be on teaching how to think, not what to think. So even when you're sharing moral dilemmas or when you're sharing moral concepts or your, your family's beliefs in religion or whatever, don't tell them what to think. Tell, teach them how to think about it and then let them come to their own thinking. That's not as easy as it is to say, look, we believe in God and that's the way it is. Well, you know, they may question that, they, but if they can learn to think about it, then they will come to their own conclusions. Um, you, you can even teach for kids that are really intense, help them learn biofeedback or other kinds of relaxed yoga, you know, any of those kinds of things that and I know, yoga and I never got along, but <laughs> that's because I was too hyper to sit still <laughs> and wanted to talk, so it didn't work for me, but I know many people that find great relaxation. One thing that I did used to do, there was a theory for a while um, about playing a certain um, beat of classical music. I think it was Bach or, and whatever. I know nothing about music, can't even play the radio. So <laughs> it's not about understanding music, but I would play that kind of classical music in my class and it really leveled everybody out because there's something about the beat, it's a 4-4 beat or something, that creates a relaxation in people. Um, I don't even remember what it was called, but, um, but it worked. And then I taught seventh grade after that, uh, one year before I became a principal, and I played um, Broadway stuff for those kids. They loved Les Mis, they loved Phantom, they, you know, I just started playing it one day, just, we had some work time, and so I just put it on, because I liked it, I'd just seen them or something, and they're like, what is that, that's so cool. So I learned that Broadway music works great with seventh graders. Um, other parenting strategies, start early by helping your child talk about his or her emotions, we kind of talked about that. Develop what's called an emotional vocabulary, and that's the other paper that I gave you. That's a list of words that can be learned and used to talk about emotions that are more than just that feels good, that feels bad. But you know, you could and you could begin to introduce those just by by asking questions that draw on that vocabulary. You don't have to show them the list, but just take a few cues from the list yourself and begin to ask some maybe more in-depth questions that would use some of that vocabulary. And that will help your kids be able to express themselves better in terms of their emotionality when they have words to use that are, that are more than just, I feel good, I feel bad, I'm happy, I'm sad. You know, what, what is that, what is the level of it and what words work to show the different levels of those particular things? Um, Use prompts sometimes with kids by saying, you know, let them answer. I feel, I feel best when. I'm afraid when. I like it when. 
I feel different when, and let them come up with some answers to those that will help you understand where they are in terms of uh, emotionality. So I feel afraid when, and they might say something that you had no idea, when you and dad both, you know, go outside. You might not have even ever thought about that. Or when you and dad, you know, go to dinner and I have a babysitter. I, I used to have this babysitter that only had one arm and it scared me to death. And now I think about it now and I think that was so stupid. But for some reason, that was scary to me. And But my parents never asked me. I mean, she was a nice lady and I'm sure she did a wonderful job except I was a brat. But <laughs> it, it, it was, she used to put her arm up on the side, on the couch like that, you know, and we'd just be, and it was, it, I don't know why that still is an image that I can't get out of my head and you know I'm an old lady now so um, no so there weren't any in those days I mean, this was back in the 50s way before any of you guys but um, it was just one of those weird things so you know sometimes you can evoke some of those things and, and out of the kids if you ask them this kind of prompting question um, you can also give what's called the overexcitabilities questionnaire. And it would probably be most appropriate for older kids. You might want to start with yourself. <laughs> but um, it, it sort of gets at thinking about the overexcitabilities and drawing out some information about it. So you might um, just ask these questions uh, of an older child or with a younger child, you might kind of re word the question so that it's more appropriate for them and ask them to draw a picture of what it is. So, do you ever feel really happy? When you feel really happy, draw me a picture of that. You know, and they might show you what it is that, you know, it's cupcakes or it's, you know, it's something that you had no idea that that really makes them happy. But in asking these things and going over this, you can, you can get a better idea delve into their little brains. Okay, um, help them discover their own escalation cycle. What is it that gets them, pushes their buttons? We all have things that push our buttons. You know, people that do such and such or somebody that says such and such. This guy doesn't get escalation at all. Can you all see the comic? Read it. Um, so what buttons push them too far? What buttons push you too far? And share those. Mm -hmm. You know, I think so often we want to shelter our children from, um, from our emotions or our failings or our feelings of inadequacy or whatever that we don't share them. So, you know, I mean, you can even share something that isn't at home. Every time my boss says such and such, I just get so angry and here's how I deal with it. So then you model what it is that you do as a person, just because you're an adult doesn't mean you're not a human being or a person, they're just a little person. So you model something that you do that works and then you know they might think, gee, that's something that I could do too. Um, develop a plan to deal with intensity, especially if they do the relaxation relaxation techniques or redirect the energies what could you do instead of throwing yourself on the floor and actually sit down with them and you know create a list what could what would be some alternatives that would still help you get that emotion out but not be quite so dramatic as throwing yourself on the floor so you make a list and then when that's about to happen you say get your list and it by, probably just by looking at the list, most of the time, it takes you away from the emotionality and dissipates it, but they could also make a choice from the list that might, you know, might work, and then from that list they might find, well, these are the things that usually work the best for me. And you can probably make your own list and use it too. One thing that you do have to do, especially if you have a very emotional child, is take a breather. You can't deal with it all the time. Both of you probably need breathers. The worst thing to do, of course, is to get into a power struggle. So, um, you know, figure out what pushes your buttons from them 
make sure they know what it is and then don't react to it because that's exactly what they're going to do the next time to get, you know, why do you think boys chase girls in kindergarten? Because they overreact and it's fun <laughs> to watch them scream. <laughs> Um, so try not to overreact, learn patience. I know I'm telling you things that you, you know, you've already heard and that you already know, but it doesn't hurt to, to kind of make a list of alternatives for you as a parent. I said that. Um, focus on the behavior that you want to see and not on the bad behavior. So try to find places where the good behavior, and teachers know this very well as a, as a discipline technique. It's figuring out when appropriate behavior is happening and reward that, and the reward can be nothing more than thanks for, um, for sitting there nicely or thanks for you know, remembering not to, to um, clang your silverware. My father used to hate because I played with the silverware all the time. So at the end of the meal, he would reach over and take my silverware, and then he would reach over and take my placemat because I couldn't stop playing with stuff. So I ended up with nothing in front of me by the end of the meal. I did get fed, though. Um, so you need, to, you need to focus on the good behavior, uh, avoid acknowledging the bad behavior, and, and as I said before, model the good behavior yourself. Model, you know, you and your husband or you and your wife um, discussing something or sharing information or saying, you know, I really prefer that you not do that. That really bugs me. How can we work this out? But, you know, in a modeling way so that they can see that screaming at each other, of course, never works. Telling, telling you how to be adults. Okay, so kids who are different. Here's to the kids who are different. The kids who don't always get A's. The kids who have ears twice the size of their peers and noses that go on for days. Here's to the kids who are different. The kids they call crazy or dumb or gifted. The kids who don't fit with the guts and the grit, who dance to a different drum. Here's to the kids with a mischievous streak, for when they have grown, as history's shown, it's their difference that makes them unique. I want to share with you um, four books that you might find um, interesting to read. Someone suggested that I bring copies of these books that you could buy right here, but I suggested that a lot of us read on our Kindles now, so any, I think most of these can be downloaded for like, you know, nine or ten dollars off of Amazon. I know they're all available by paperback on Amazon. Living with Intensity is by Susan Daniels, Dr. Susan Daniels, who is a psychologist um, right here in California and very well known. Um, I have a friend who is the most intense person I've ever known in my entire life, and she has this book on her bedstead to read daily to remind her how to live with her intensity. The rest of us can't, but at least she's learning to live with it. Um, a book called Emotional Intensity is by Christina Fonseca, who was the gal that I said writes mysteries, and, and um, she's also a Californian, I believe. She, all of these people have spoken at our conference before. Uh, once Upon a Mind is by Jim Delisle, who um, was once the um, National Association for Gifted Children president and is a psychologist himself, an educator. And Misdiagnosis by Jim, Dr. Jim Webb, who is um, out of Tucson, but he um, comes to our conference every year. Very, very he's the one, it have, do, do any of you know about SENG, S-E-N-G, Social Emotional Needs of the Gifted? It's an organization that um, he started, and he's the one that wrote the book, um, Guiding Your Gifted Child, if you've ever seen that and talks about parents doing SEN groups together, if any of you have ever heard of that. They are, by the way, having a conference this summer in July that it would be an excellent conference for parents. The information will be on our website after I put it up tomorrow. It's in San Jose this year, so it's relatively close, and they're a wonderful resource for parents. And the last, oh, that's all of them. Um, 
And then I want to remind you, if you don't, if you're not all, all, already aware, it's time for me to stop, isn't it? <laughs> already aware of it is that Eureka is having a teacher summer teacher and student institute this summer in June. Um, we have 86 teachers and 40. 87 teachers now. Somebody signed up while we were here tonight. Okay. Um, and 43 kids. We'd like to have about 100 kids and about 120 teachers. And um, your children will have the opportunity to attend if they're, from, if they're going to be entering first through ninth grade. And what, what we do, at the, this is a teacher institute. So it's a demonstration school. The kids are taught by expert teachers who have been trained with Dr. Sandra Kaplan, who is CAG's guru to, in education, um, and they come, they come, uh, will come up, and they teach the kids starting on Monday of that week, which is June 23rd to the 27th. They start on Monday. The kids start on Monday, and they go Monday and Tuesday, and then teachers who want to learn more about differentiated instruction start on Wednesday, and in the morning they observe the kids, and then excuse me, in the afternoon then they learn strategies that they've seen in the classrooms during the day. But what the kids will do is they'll learn the differentiation icons, which they can then apply to their own research and learning, and they learn some research techniques, and then they dive into something that they're interested in for, and it's, it's quick, it's only a week, but you know, they're all bright kids, so they can move quickly. You know, we need to talk about something once or twice. All of the kids will be doing very similar lessons, so it doesn't matter what grade level is observed by the teachers, they'll all have discussions. So the teachers are learning, the kids are getting an opportunity for challenge. We've been doing it 17 years in Santa Barbara and never heard a negative thing from a, about a kid not liking it. Um, one of the teachers was telling me as she was leaving that she says, there's no way my kid's going because he says, I know all the teachers, they're all going to see me in the classroom, I'm not going. So <laughs> maybe some kids don't want to go for other reasons, but um, it's other than academic talent search in this area, there really aren't a lot of other academic challenging opportunities for gifted kids in this area, and we're, we're delighted that Eureka wants to have it for the first time. This is sponsored by CAG and done by CAG, but supported by Eureka, and um, lots of your teachers will be attending. Yeah, lucky <coughs> us to have the opportunity to work with Dr. Kaplan. Mm -hmm. um, we have studied Dr. Kaplan's work for years and years and used the icons of depth and complexity in our classrooms. But did you mention that she has new ones that she's Yeah, she has new ones now connected to Common Core. So teachers will be learning, even the, even teachers who have been to every gate training there ever was and uh, do all of this stuff in their class, they're common because they want to learn the new things. How many of you have already signed your kids up? Any of you guys? Okay, it, uh, there was a flyer that went out that had um, an application form on it, but I would read, I'm not, I really would prefer that you not mail those to me, that you go online and fill out the form. You don't know how many hours it takes when people mail things in to me, so I'm going high tech here. Register online, it's a very easy application. You can either put your credit card in or say you're gonna send a check later, um, and I'll find you if you don't pay. So, uh, we'd love to have your children join us um, for that week, and uh, if any of you are teachers, we'd love to see you as teachers. You don't have to be a Eureka teacher. All, any teacher in California can attend. Yes? Are they broken out by grades? Yes, they're broken out by grades. We, we're taking kids from one to nine, but there'll probably only be about five teachers, so there'll probably be some combinations, like six, eight, or something like that for the older kids. Um, but they do pretty much about the same thing, just at whatever their level is. So, um, that's, yeah, that's the way it works. And there are no more than 20 kids in a class. We keep them small so that um, the teachers can work with them. It's kind of hard to teach kids in one week. And did you want to mention the parent night? That is on Wednesday. Oh yeah, there's a parent night on Wednesday, so if you do um, attend, they'll well they'll give out the information the first day when the kids come. But there is a parent night where you can learn what they're learning. 
so that you can have, is it Wednesday or Tuesday? Wednesday night. Wednesday night. Mm -hmm. And then there's a special novice session for teachers who haven't ever had any differentiation training before to, co to go on Tuesday afternoon. So it's a full week. Yes? How, how much is this and what are the hours that they're... The kids are 8.45 to 12 and it's 150. Um, the Teacher Institute is 485 for non-members, 400 for members, and 375, which you're getting, for teams of 10 or more. How much is it for the kids again? 150. And please don't sign up and then unsign, because then I have to refund your money, and that's a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> Are you talking about in this district? Yes. Okay. Uh -huh. um, the question is, it, it sounds like the, the gate kids are going to be integrated with the not regular kids. I don't know. <laughs> that but, means that your kids are irregular. <laughs> <laughs> no, I uh, generally. So, uh, my question is, is uh, why is it structured that way versus just having a gate class between all the gate students? Mm -hmm. and, because um, I was just wondering how that takes away from the other kids learning and and splitting up, you know, it's kind of made difficult to split them up in doing different work. Did everybody hear the question? Okay. And Dr. Branch can help us with this as well. Um, the, what the other way of doing things would be what we know as a self-contained classroom that would be only gate identified students in a classroom as Dr. Branch uh, discussed that she taught in the Sac City Unified School District. In a larger district, that is a possibility. In a district such as Eureka, I just mentioned we have 16 identified third graders. That's not large enough for a class. And we could, someone would say, well, make it second and third grade. Well, theoretically, that would be 32 kids if we had the same number. So it's a, it's a situation of a small district having to deal with some challenges that are the numbers of students. The other thing that, that, that is a, a feature of if we had 20 students or 25 or 30 students to constitute a class, the class would need to be set at a campus that may not be your neighborhood school. That brings up other challenges because you may have two or three children who go to that neighborhood school, the school where you live, but that one student who's gate identified can't go there because the class is set at a different campus. That is problematic and brings up other issues. So districts that do that need to have a self-contained class. I came from the Rockland Unified School District where I served for four years as deputy superintendent. One of my main programs was the gate program. We did have a self-contained program, but we had 11 elementary schools from which to draw the students. Most many of the parents chose not to attend the, the self-contained program across town at a school that was not their neighborhood school. Therefore, we needed to set up cluster classes, very similar to what we're talking about here on the neighborhood school campuses. So we have studied at a, as a gate advisory committee and a staff the work of Dr. Susan Weinbrenner who talks a lot, and I would invite you to take a look at her research, about what the next step would be. What's the next best idea here? And that is clustering the students. So you should have received, raise your hand if you have not received, a letter um, asking you if you prefer to have a gate certified teacher. Anybody didn't get it? Did not, you did get it, okay, yeah. And so this is our opportunity to ask you if you would like your children to be placed in a classroom with a gate certified teacher. Those are teachers that have attended a training that Dr. Branch is discussing, have knowledge, have background, and we are selecting teachers that we really believe have the passion, the insights, the love of all these things that we're just talking about. And when we look at Susan Weinbrenner's work, we strategically place our cluster of students and anywhere, it'll depend on the number of students. You think about three, cam we have three campuses with those 16 kids. They're gonna spread over, it's probably not gonna be eight and eight into the two uh, Ridgeview and Excelsior. It'll depend how many go to each of the sites to determine do we need two teachers, do we need one teacher? Probably one, you know, probably one at one place and two at another. We're gonna be the gate certified teachers. 
And so when we strategically place that cluster of students into that teacher's classroom, we know that the teacher has the training, the abilities to step those students over here and do some other kinds of differentiated things when the rest of the class is doing other things. But also at the same time, we will strategically not place other students in that cluster class who would need some specialized instruction, such as English learners. I'll use that as a group. Now, we may have a teacher at that same grade level, we do, who has a passion and a, and a love for kids that are learning a second language. And those students have some additional support. That cluster of students may be in another class. So that that teacher has the ability to really focus there with the English learners, another teacher with the GATE students. So that's the concept. Um, special needs students that have some very, very special um, requirements may not be in the GATE cluster class. But we also have another challenge in our district, and that has to do with kind of our history of parents maybe wanting to have a GATE certified teacher, but really having an idea of who the teacher should be more than the <laughs> GATE certification. And so that's another issue that we deal with. And so we can't say for certain that those 16 identified, I'll just take 16 because that's the number that I mentioned earlier, of 16 new third graders. Will every one of those 16 students' parents allow them to be in one of the GATE cluster classes? We're not sure. We'll try our best to put the, the cluster classes together. Hopefully that answers a bit of your question. Can I add something sure. to that? Yes, too. One of the dilemmas that you have with another moral dilemma, one of the problems that you have with a, a self-contained full day class is if you have too many kids, then some kids don't get to be in the class. And that's a that situation that we had in Sac City, even though we had five, but we also had 68 elementary schools, so a huge district. But I always had kids who qualified, but there wasn't room in the class. And you can't make a larger class by union contract with teachers. So you'd have kids that didn't have the opportunity, whereas a cluster can be any size. So that's, that's another. And we have a few more questions. So let's finish up your question, and then we'll go to these others. Okay, sorry, I just have a follow up to that. Uh, is it applied across math, English, science, and is that all the topic for Across the subject areas, yes it is. And uh, because the students have been identified for their exceptional abilities, not necessarily in particular subject areas. If they talk to you about the test that they took, it was problem solving. It had some reading, but a lot of problem solving patterns, that kind of thing. So the teacher would, across those multiple subjects, absolutely be able to group and come up with differentiated instructional opportunities for those kids. Okay, other questions? Yes. Okay, so to make sure I understand, so in our district, our program consists of the kids that are in gate are clustered together, unless a parent says, no, I actually want to have this teacher. So they'll be clustered together at the, within their class. Mm -hmm. So they'll have the same teacher. Mm -hmm. And on a daily, a weekly, a monthly basis, what are we talking about here in terms of the receiving the differentiated instruction where they have the opportunity to go outside the box? Mm -hmm. On a regular basis, it will have to see how that works. You know, we've got also other opportunities that I wanted to mention where PLC teams, our teachers get together in their professional learning community teams on Mondays on your when your kids come home early. The teachers go into their professional learning community teams, and at that point, they develop different lessons at different levels at a particular time, possibly every day, where the kids switch. At, if you have anybody at Maidu, anybody here from Maidu? It's called win time, and the kids go at a particular assigned time. There might be a remedial, a, a teacher that's gonna take all the kids that need remediation, another teacher, all the kids that are our gate, ident almost identified kids, to work on, on uh, enrichment. That will happen within the grade level, so they might even switch to a different teacher. But then within the classroom, let's say they're working on a social studies project, and students don't need additional help with the vocabulary. They're already well beyond that. They may be over here to work on something very special. At Excelsior and Ridgeview right now, the principals are working with students that have specialized interests in a particular area. Could be done on their own, could be done in a group. And so that's another idea that happens alongside of the instructional program. Will it be every day for 60 minutes? We wouldn't say that it would be that, 
possibly a teacher may structure it that way. After the teachers have an idea, they're going to be seeing the kids in action by the teachers that are trained by Dr. Kaplan this summer. That's going to change the way that they're thinking about instruction. The other thing that we've written into our LCAP that came out of a lot of discussion with the GATE Advisory Committee and the staff is development of what we're calling, just for another a term that we need to use, <coughs> GATE coaches. And so the concept there is that there would be a teacher on every one of our school sites, TK to three, all the way to seventh and eighth, at one of the set, everybody would have a coach on a campus who would be the person to go to if I'm a teacher and I say, yeah, I'm really struggling with how to do some differentiation in my classroom. This would be somebody who is a full-time teacher, has responsibility, probably the gate cluster teacher at that particular grade level, but TK to three, someone very interested in gate with specialized training, very passionate and interested about how to help students through their teachers, and then they would create a cadre of seven teachers across the district who would receive specialized training, work together to help support our program. That was a concept that we have never done before in our district, but we really feel passionately important that it's important for our students to have access to teachers that have ongoing assistance. The other thought was that it would bring some kind of cohesiveness across the district so that as the kids are moving forward across the grade levels. Yes? I just wondered, I just wanted to clarify, when you said uh, you're going to try and see how it works in terms of the clusters, uh -huh. it depends on what the mm -hmm. parents are requesting. Mm -hmm. So are you, is your intent to go ahead and set up the clusters, but then if there, if there are parents who say, I don't want my child to participate because I don't want this other teacher or whatever, then it may we will have we will have clusters of students. I have no doubt of that. We have had clusters of students in the past. So this is not something brand new. But there may be it wouldn't I'm just saying that there may be some gate identified students who wouldn't be in the cluster. But there will be clusters. Definitely there will be. The majority of parents say absolutely I want a gate certified teacher. Yeah. Yeah. I mean on the parent input forms you only can that's true. Saying you can't I did true. in quality of a teacher. You true. cannot pick the teacher. That's true. So yeah. I, I just want to lay that out there. That is true. We do not allow teachers by name. Really that is true. Do that. Yeah. So mm -hmm. if you choose not to go with a gate instructor, mm -hmm. that could be whatever the group of teachers. That's that correct. You won't necessarily pinpoint a teacher. That is right. Mm -hmm. That's my understanding. Yes, so, that's true. Because these forms are due this week, uh -huh. correct? Yes. Are you making available who the gate identified teachers are? No, because you can't, you, you're, there is no opportunity to select by teacher. We're looking at attributes. We're looking at things that are going to match up with your child. And so if your child is gate identified, we would want your child to match up with a gate certified teacher as the cluster teacher. And then in some grade levels, we do have our students move into different math groups, starting at fourth, fifth, and sixth, and of course, seventh and eighth. So the math can be leveled as well. So we may create, actually, we will create an accelerated math path as well, um, beginning at fourth, fifth, and sixth grade. Yes, Rachel. I'm just wondering, when you're looking at teachers to potentially teach this new gay cluster, what type of criteria would you be looking for besides the fact that they've had training? Would there be additional criteria? Mm -hmm. Sure. Teachers who are enthusiastic, passionate about uh, our GATE program, assisting students, well-versed in the icons of depth and complexity, those that are flexible and really interested in differentiation. So then do they uh, go to their principal and say, hey, I'm interested, is that how that is working? Could be a way. Principal Could be a way. Principals are very aware of how the teachers are teaching. They're evaluating and supervising the teachers all the time. And so there's opportunities for the principals to also solicit a possible interest on the part of a teacher. Gee, would you like to be our sort of our gate teacher for this grade level? And again, it will depend on the number of students moving through each of the grades who are placed in those classrooms in, in that grade level to determine the number of gate um, cluster classes that we'll actually need on the campus. And that's why the forms are due right away because we're looking forward to looking at how many teachers will we actually need to identify. Would you go one level deeper and look at as we fill out these forms, like, you know, we know our kid is in the intensities, mm -hmm. you know, the creative intensity. Mm -hmm. So could, could my child get matched with a teacher who is very creative if that was something that I 
it would be very important to go ahead and write that on your form because mm -hmm. the principals will not have access possibly to that information. So go ahead and write it on your form. This is a particular area, you know, and, and you might find one in here. You, you mentioned artistic expression, you know, whatever it is that is important for the principals to know. Very important. Yes. Uh, can you just clarify, is this the form that was mailed to the house about the gate program, or is this went home? You have to get it from the school office. Okay. Yeah, you will get it from the school office, uh-huh. But the reminder was that you would need to let us know if you want to be um, with a gate certified teacher. Yeah. Okay. Is that the way to let you know? Uh-huh. Okay, that's, that's right. That way with your principal. Okay. Uh -huh. Do you have teleprints, or you can just put it on the form? And you can it put it on the form and turn it in. Uh-huh. And what school? Okay, great. Yeah. For example, Cabot, I just found out today, uh -huh. or the day before yesterday, uh -huh. that they don't have them. Yes, uh, the 7th and 8th grade, I'm sorry, we should clarify, that is 4th, 5th, and 6th grade, Ridgeview and Excelsior that have the forms. Cabot and Olympus operate a master schedule, and so the teachers are, the kids have a seven period day, and they have teacher different teachers for every subject. And so the, the, the students are grouped according to ability and performance level in each of those classes. And so we make sure that we serve the kids in a different way at the junior high schools. So there won't be a form to, to fill out at seventh and eighth grade. But the secretary told me to take the letter you sent to us uh -huh. and forward that letter to her. She says, okay, when I did that, you're good now. You have okay. applied for Okay. Teacher. All right. That's fine. That's a cabin. <laughs> All right. That's what the secretary told you at cabin. Okay. Yeah, me too. Me too. Okay, I'll clarify that. But maybe they are accepting just so that you there's knowledge because you received it as a sixth grade parent, of course. Okay. I'll clear, I'll check on that. Yes. Are you still going to have the personalized plans for Yes. Uh huh. And so that regardless of whether you're Absolutely. Great question. Mm -hmm. That she's speaking of the individualized gate plan and the gate advisory committee did look at those. Those may be something that Dr. Branch can help us to um, improve, but whether or not the student is in a gate um, cluster class, every gate identified student receives an individual gate plan and that is in conjunction with the um, fall um, conferencing that you're familiar with, but you'd receive those, I believe those are in our early October those would be developed by the teachers and sent home. If you're at seventh and eighth grade, the conferences are a little early, and so you'd receive them home with your student for the seventh and eighth graders. Yes. I actually have a question kind of about the training that, oh, we, great. that we got today. Oh, great. Okay. Okay. You mentioned that you had done the teachers earlier today, and considering that in our district, gate doesn't start till third grade, but for my, my son, it was a problem in first and second grade because he was bored and then acting out and, and having these kind of issues in the classroom, which led to lots of conferences and sort of thing. Is this training going to be offered to other teachers that aren't gate teachers who oh. might be experiencing our gate children before they are done? Oh, yes, <laughs> um, and, and we wanted to mention that the training is always open to all teachers, okay. TK to 8. And in fact, we had mostly primary teachers okay. earlier today. Um, one of the things with the gate coaches, we are not limiting it to those uh, grade levels where the students are actually formally identified. Because truly, we know who our gate students are. You know who they are. Uh, early on, first day of kindergarten. I'm a kindergarten teacher, can you tell? And uh, I could tell. And so we begin very early to identify our students and to not have those kinds of things result if we can possibly help it. Now we have our champion, Dr. Branch, who helps us with those kinds of things. Lots of different training, but yes. In fact, of the 87, you said, teachers that are registered, mm -hmm. I'll bet that many, many, many of them are primary teachers this summer to come to the training. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, most of the focus is in four, five, and six, but there are quite a few primary teachers. Mm -hmm. And another thing that I was just sharing with Linda um, earlier today is Dr. Kaplan is going to be doing an online course in early identification. And um, so we'll share that with the, with the primary teachers. It might be something they'd like to do as um, just to, to know how do I, if I'm not sure, how do I recognize, not identify, but recognize who and those kids it. are and, and <laughs> deal with it, yeah. And learn more about 
gifted kids. And how often do you do, like this is my first experience with them, how often do you kind of do these teacher and parent training and things for us? I do whenever I'm asked. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Branch participated with us in November this year and we then did, again now. I've done so, two for you guys. Yeah. And, and then she attends all of our uh, gate advisory committee meetings and our board meetings as well. And uh, But we can do them more often and that will run through our, our gate advisory committee. That is something that came up and it is included in our LCAP as more opportunities for parents mm -hmm. to be made. Yes? Um, the event you spoke of on May 12th about uh -huh. math, yes. uh, I did not receive an email about are that. Are you a 5th so through 8th grade parent? Yes. You are. Okay. I'll ask the principals to send that out okay. again. That would be great. Okay. It's the math. It, just so you know, it's at 6 to 7 p.m. at Oakmont High School. And it's to develop an understanding on the part of parents for, from the Roseville City, Dry Creek, and Eureka School District together with the high school district because we feed uh, into their seven campuses. The new change in the mathematical pathway, which is an integrated model. So if you recall, we most of us had algebra, geometry, algebra two. Now imagine those are together in an integrated pathway. So we'll explain that in this discussion at Oakmont High School, May 12th, 6 p.m. Uh-huh. Yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Burke. I'm going to ask her a question. Uh -huh. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so it's our, we have a third grader. Uh -huh. And a lot of things you're saying is we're going to do this. This is the new method. Is, so just briefly, is this new, what you guys are doing these days? Or is this a continuation of what's been going on for the last 10 years? It's an improved continuation of what's been going on Starting in about the last Yes, in, in about the last three or four years. Because prior to that, the district had a program called the High Achiever Program and really allowed eligibility for students who were both, as Barbara was mentioning, these really hard workers, but they may not be intellectual, intellectually gifted. And so in the last four, maybe this is going on five years, the district has shifted into a truly gifted identification program. So students who are in our seventh and eighth grade, we might see more of a blend of our high achievers. But now, with the 13 new third grade identified students, they are truly gifted students. So we need to deliver a different program for them because they really do need specifics. Yes, sir. So just for clarification for myself, the gate program, as it stands right now, will not be starting until the fourth grade, correct? Right? Students who are actually identified, formally identified, will begin at fourth grade because okay. we identified them at third grade. There has been some discussion at the Gate Advisory Committee about moving that eligibility um, assessment down to second grade, but that's not something that's been uh, fully formed yet. However, we are looking at our TK to third grade students to be able to provide differentiation because the teachers know who those students are regardless of the eligibility. So will, for example, the son goes to Hills, will Green Hills have a gate coach then? Yes. This, Every, uh, this coming year? That is in the LCAP draft plan. Okay. And so if it survives the concepts that we are going to show the gate advice, the, I'm sorry, the parent advisory committee and all of the bargaining groups, the, the public hearings before the board, if it is something that everyone embraces, then we will budget for it. The LCAP is a companion to the, the district budget. Gate has been shown as a priority. It means money needs to be put next to it. And gate coaches cost money. Are we willing to pay for gate coaches? If we are, here's a plan for it. We definitely think, the community thinks it's important. But that gate coach is going to be a teacher. It would be a full, people. that's correct. Uh -huh. At each, there would be seven gate coaches in the, in the district. And I'm using the word gate coach because that's what we used in the LCAP. Could come up with a different term, but that's our plan. Mm -hmm. Good question. Yes. As parents, um, and uh, like I'm a new parent to this, um, are we invited to gate uh, committee? Advisory Yeah, committee? advisory. Yes. Are we uh -huh. going to be getting yes. receiving emails and yes, just you will. make us aware? Uh -huh. okay. Absolutely. And we'll keep you posted through the principals. They'll ask for um, identified representatives for each of the schools for mm -hmm. each um, school year. Okay. So we'd love to have you come and be a part of our committee. You'll be getting lots of emails about our mm -hmm. our meetings and so forth. So you talked about the, the newly identified, the uh -huh. 16 third graders. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. So what are the totals now that we have mm -hmm. for, because 
once you're identified, you stay within the program. You do. You continue on, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, we have about, I, I would say that the percentage in, in our district, we're trying to bring it down. It had been at one time 12% of our students to 15% with the High Achiever program. Right now with our new statistics, we're probably down in the 5% of our students or so. Um, so 150 students or so um, in our district that are identified gate. But again, we have higher numbers. Um, at the seventh and eighth grade level than we would at the primary level. That will be dropping. Mm -hmm. yep. You're welcome. Yes. Oh, I apologize for getting back to the gate form. On the email that uh -huh. you sent, I did fill out the form and okay. turn it in requesting a gate certified teacher. But on the form, it said that you could not guarantee that our children would be placed with a gate mm -hmm. certified teacher. Mm -hmm. That's right. So what would be the point of requesting <laughs> one? <laughs> because we want to know how, I, I don't think that's possible, but, um, but we always want to put something on there just in case. Um, I don't believe that there would be any issue with that, not with the number of teachers that are going to be certified this summer. Mm -hmm. Should not be a problem. Yes. I'm still not really clear about Moramino School. My son is in Olympus, uh -huh. and I remember I received an email saying that if you want your child to be placed in a classroom with a gay certificate uh -huh. teacher, then we would talk to the school and request. Is that how, how, how okay. we supposed to do that? That is what this gentleman talked about with Cabot. And so I need to talk with the principals at each of the junior high schools to be sure that that form is to be turned back in. So is it your child is in seventh grade right now? Yes. Okay. So I'll need to clarify that and we'll get back to you. Yeah, and uh, also last year I received the exactly same kind of letter yeah. and I called uh, Olympus and said I was told that all the teacher in Olympus are gay. Yes. So that I assume true. maybe the same situation uh -huh. this year, or can, something can change? That, that's possible. Let me check for you, okay. and we'll have the uh, principals get back to you uh, to be sure that we have that information appropriately disseminated to everybody, not just those people that are here. Okay. Does anybody have an intensity question? <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> an excitement <laughs> question. Yeah. So, whenever the kids were tested, okay, so what? Um, they're tested in the, and the test has a bunch of problem-based questions. But does the test measure their intensities at all? No, not really. So basically That's the intensities are a characteristic of children who have tested for giftedness based on yeah, those are really more anecdotal kinds of things that are recognized by you as parents and, and the teachers. And as the teachers are become more aware and are trained, they'll be able to do that, you know, do that better. Unfortunately, in teacher school and principal school, you don't learn anything about gifted kids. It's, it's not part of the credential program. It's not part of BITSA. We've tried for years as CAG to try to get to be part of BITSA, which is the beginning teacher training um, program, and it's just, it's, so, it's a fight. Because what's funny is my gate kid doesn't have any of this stuff. But my <laughs> other daughter, who didn't, who didn't qualify for gate, she's got the intensities. Huh. So it's kind of like, huh, well. Well, she know. may not have qualified, but <laughs> she might be gifted and doesn't test well. Mm -hmm. So. Never know. Yeah. <laughs> all these, all these things that are unique to kids. If I have an offline. Oh, I opened oh, up good. the Pandora's. <laughs> Back to the training. Yes. I just wanted to know if I had like a personal question, I could talk to you after. Sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, I still have a question about uh, the student uh, institute in summer. Oh, uh huh. Um, what was the benefit of a children attending the class, and what what do I tell him? What are you going to do there? He's oh. going to. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's thing. Oh that's a good question. He's going to do nothing but hard work. <laughs> um, he's going to learn the icons of the depth, depth and complexity and learn how to use them to help him with his thinking. And he's also going to learn how to do research and how to, and then be able to dive into something that he's interested in using those tools. So that's space. I have a write-up that explains this better that I'll put up on the website. I think that um, might be more exciting for the kids. The kids just think it's they're going to school. Yeah. Yeah. Now this My is not boring school. school. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing that I think is important for kids to know is this is an opportunity to work with other gifted kids mm -hmm. and have cognitive what we call cognitive peers 
to be able to work with somebody else that thinks like you do and is interested in the things you're interested in, which the cluster grouping will help a great deal with, but until you know that's implemented, many of the kids haven't had the opportunity to work with other kids that, that are like-minded. Gifted kids get together. I used to teach um, geocaching at the Academic Talent Search for the last, um, it's still I went back to work. Um, for about four summers and those kids absolutely loved working with each other and getting together um, with other kids who were interested in the same things they were they found each other and that's so that that's uh, it's sort of hard to convince kids to go to summer school I know it's <laughs> parents call me and say tell me more about this camp and I say it's not camp <laughs> sorry it's not camp any other questions yeah. I, have a, I have a quick question in your in your belief how many uh, do you believe that all that if a child is identified as gifted and also identified as ADHD do you believe that is it is misdiagnosed well, you'd have to look into it further. Mm -hmm. There are far too many misdiagnoses mm -hmm. of gifted kids as ADHD when they're just psycho, psychomotor intense, mm -hmm. um, and, and particularly boys. Mm -hmm. So we do find that, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of literature about that. But, the, but you do know about twice exceptionality and the fact that there are gifted kids who also have other exceptionalities. Um, Asperger's syndrome, uh, Tourette syndrome, learning handy, other learning kinds of handicaps. Um, we didn't believe that when I first started teaching GATE and um, I worked with our psychologist to identify some kids who um, had some twice exceptionalities and she helped me you know be able to get some services for them but we you were not allowed if a kid was identified gifted you were not allowed to to try to get special ed help for them so this is a relatively new field but yes there are far too many misdiagnosed far too many but how you decide whether it's really real or not is sort of a rock and a hard place <laughs> Any other questions? I know I'm sure you're ready to get going home. Do you have any um, strategy recommendations for your daydream for a daydreaming child that does not like uh, to do like the worksheets and stuff that right now my kid considers to be pretty boring and it's kind of excruciating to get her to sit down and focus on them. I mean, once she does them, it's really it's really easy, but there's a lot of drama involved with yeah. getting her to, <laughs> to, to do well, them. Uh, <laughs> the number one, that's a conversation to be had with the teacher mm -hmm. about what other things could, what other opportunities could there be. Like if, the, if it's 30 long division problems and she already knows how to do it, then can she do the five hardest? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, can we delve into something else. Um, if that doesn't happen, then, are you talking about homework or yeah, in class? Homework, yeah, homework, um, yeah. Try to set up some kind of a, of a system where, you know, she's at the kitchen table or whatever, and you say, okay, I'm gonna go away, and I just want you to do five, and then we'll do this for a while, and then come back and do five more so that it's not that, you know, tedium of doing all of them all at once something to try but it's probably that she just doesn't want to do them <laughs> I don't blame her <laughs> anything else I'm sure you're ready to go home thank you so much for coming thank you. Thank you.